Good evening. I want, want to welcome, welcome you all to our event tonight with Syed Masood. Um, he'll be here talking about his book, The, ba um, the Bad Muslim Discount. Um, but before we get started, I would like to tell you a little bit about um, us. My name is Karen Manuel. I am a board member of the Friends of the Alameda Free Library. The Friends is a nonprofit organization that fund, raises funds and helps support programs at our local wonderful library. Um, we accept donations, large and small, and at some moment during the program, you'll see a link um, go into the chat that um, will allow you to make a donation after the program if you'd like. Uh, this is a live webinar. We will have your cameras and your microphones turned off. You may communicate with each other and with us through the chat, and you can find that at the bottom of your screen. You probably all know where to find that by now after all the Zooming we've been doing. Um, do want to remind you to be respectful in your comments. Um, if you don't do that, we'll be, you'll be removed from the program, and we don't want that to happen. So I'd like to welcome right now Syed Masood to the program. Um, he's um, an attorney living and working in Sacramento. He's published three books in the last two years, and we're focusing on one of them. Uh, but the other two books are More Than Just a Pretty Face, which is a young adult book, and Sway With Me, which is, I understand, is sort of a coming of age story. Um, so welcome, Syed, to the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So tell me, was it challenging writing or at least publishing three two years? Yeah, it was uh, it wasn't a party, <laughs> you know, so um, it, it it got way tougher than I had thought. Um, so the way I'm gonna give up a little peek behind the curtain, I guess. Um, I wrote the bad Muslim discount, and I didn't really have any um, serious hopes that it would end up getting published uh, because it's a difficult industry, um, and so I ended up getting it submitted, but. As you know, um, there are some very difficult topics that I had to deal with in Bad Muslim um, and some very heavy stuff that was very emotionally draining. Um, and to recover from that, I wrote Pretty Face before Bad Muslim sold. Um, and more than just a Pretty Face ended up going to auction first and it got sold first. So it got published first. Bad Muslim sold about three months later and then it came out second. So, um, and then I was under contract for, for Sway. So that's how it all worked out. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really tough. There were, there were days when I was working, sleeping for three hours a day and then going back to work. It was really, it was really something. Um, I gained like 40 pounds. It was, it was, <laughs> it was, uh, my caffeine intake went through the roof. But, uh, you know, it ended up being worth it. It's, I've been very blessed with being able to do three books now. So uh, yeah, it was fun in its own way. <laughs> well, sort of. It sounds like it. I, I'm sure it's very rewarding now to have um, this much success with your books. So um, I, I did, somebody in the chat had asked me to hold up the book again. Oh, I see what. It, it, uh, yeah, the cameras, your cameras just. Uh, yeah, I have the background. So there you go. Thank you. Say it. No so um, I'm, I'm curious why you focused on young adults in your other two books. Well, it was. Um, it wasn't really a conscious decision. The story just ended up being what the story is. Um, it was about a young man and um, uh, his voice ended up being a young adult voice. I didn't set out to write a young adult book. Um, and then also, I think, you know, people ask me what the difference is between writing young adult and, and adult fiction. And I've, I've come to the realization that what it is, is essentially adult fiction is the fiction of discontent. It's, a fi it's, it's the fiction of you know, your character finds themselves in a place and they're thinking about how did I get here? Why am I here? What's my purpose? They're, they're trying to figure out their life in a later stage. Um, young adult fiction is a fiction of firsts, you know, first love, um, first jobs, first ev everything really. So it's, it's the fiction of hope is what I like to call it. So um, they're, they're different in that sense. Um, and so I think some stories fit better in one and some in the other. Uh, we have some wonderful writers writing in young adult and just uh, being their contemporary is, 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 is really cool. Uh, but we have some great authors uh, in that arena. I mean, you know, super famous ones are like Angie Thomas, for example, um, The Hate You Give, um, also an excellent movie. 
um, you know, Karen McManus, uh, Katie Henry. So we've got wonderful authors in that arena and, and I was uh, really happy to enter that conversation. So. Great, well, before we get into the book, with, because there's a lot to talk about with the book, um, I, we are curious about your journey. Um, your, your brief bio says that you've, um, you're a citizen of three different countries. You've lived in nine cities. I'd, I'd really love to hear your story about how you got from Karachi, where you were born, um, and got to ended up in Sacramento. Right. So um, when I was around, I want to say two, I was, I was I'm not sure. I'm, this is all hearsay. Um, but, but when I was <laughs> Looking like two, an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> when I was around two or so, my dad um, got um, a, um, an admission into, to, to do his MBA at the University of Texas at Arlington. So my mom, my dad, and I moved to the States, uh, lived in Arlington, Texas. Um, and then my father wanted to move back to Pakistan. So that's what we did. Um, and then uh, about, I want to say 15 years later, 14, no, 13 years later, he decided that wasn't a good idea. So, <laughs> so then we had to come back to the West. He decided to go to Canada this time. So then I became a Canadian citizen and then we moved to the States and then I became an American citizen. So those are my three, uh, or those were my three um, citizenships. And then after I got out of college, I went to different places and lived in different places. So, so Fremont shows up um, in your book, um, in this book. And I'm wondering, have you ever lived in Fremont? Yes, I have lived in Fremont. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, um, since we are here for a library event, um, more than just a pretty face has a romance that's set primarily in a library. Um, so, you know, <laughs> because libraries were, were one of those things in, in uh, Anwar talks about this a little bit in, in Bad Muslim, where I didn't have access to books, really. My library growing up was very similar to Anwar's library growing up, where, you know, we had Archie comics and romance novels, and I wasn't allowed to read the romance novels. And so <laughs> I just had Archie comics. In fact, I wasn't even allowed to read Archie comics because my mom thought that comic books ruined your, your grammar for some reason. Um, and so I really had very limited access to literature growing up. And when I went to a library for the first time here, uh, well, in Canada, actually in Toronto, I was blown away, you know? Um, so uh, yeah, I have a great appreciation for libraries and Pretty Face is in a, in a way uh, indicative of that, so. Okay, thank you. Give them money is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, appreciate the plug too. Um, so, you know, I, I really love the book. I read it, well, I, I listened to it um, on audio twice and then I bought the book. <laughs> So I wouldn't have it. I wanted to make notes too. Um, but I found it really full of action and love and angst and humor. Um, there were some really difficult topics. And I don't know, I, I want to say this on the outside. I don't really understand the culture or the religion even. And um, so I may stumble through and be um, completely um, ignorant about certain things. So don't don't feel shy about correcting me. <laughs> I'm completely okay no, it's with it. Actually, one of the things I've come to realize I didn't know this when I was writing the book because when you're writing something, you're, you kind of assume that everyone knows the same things you know, you know? Uh -huh. um, and and the, the, some of the emails I've gotten from people, they're like, oh, I learned so much about Islam from Anwar. I'm like, no, no, you didn't. Know about <laughs> he's the wrong one. <laughs> right, he's the wrong one. Don't learn from him. And it's the first person narrative. So it's also biased in, in certain ways because it's coming from him. So it's always interesting to get those emails because I'm like, oof. <laughs> I'm flattered and thank you for reading, but at the same time, uh, Anwar Faris may not be uh, your best source for information about Islam. <laughs> well, I also think that um, it was really instructive about people who are going through difficult times and have to leave their homes, their homelands, and go to a place where their culture is foreign to the local culture. And um, that's an extremely challenging position to be in. And the older you are, probably the more challenging it is, I'm guessing. Um, so I felt for the parents and, um, and could have kind of, well, yeah, I don't want to say too much, but um, I did feel for the parents. Um, so I, um, I wanted to first start off with a friend of mine from my Wicked Women's Book Club um asked me to say to you and she's also an immigrant um and i think she's also a citizen of three countries i believe <laughs> or has been 
Um, she wants to say that she really enjoyed your book. She found it absorbing and educational. The characters were great. Um, fascinating traditions coming to America from other countries to contribute to our diversity, family and spiritual issues that were ran across the board. Um, she asks if you are basing your characters on a compilation of people you've met or people in your life. Um, no, not not really. Um, you know, Anwar, my wife accuses me of being very similar to Anwar, um, which, you know, I deny. Um, but <laughs> there, there is the early parts of Anwar's life, there, there, are, there is some uh, similarity. I feel like he's, he's, you know, way more of a jerk than I am. Um, but, <laughs> you know, but seriously, um, I, I have a great affection for Anwar, but I think we're very different people. Circumstances are very different. Um, I try not to incorporate people I know into the book because they're going to read it. Um, well, that's like that's not true. The amount of people in my family who've betrayed me by not reading this book. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, you don't you don't want to do that. I feel like that's you know it's someone else's story, um, and you don't want to necessarily you know um, uh, color it in a way that comes across as unfair to them. I, I kind of feel like. When authors do that, it's it's a dangerous it's a dangerous place to go. One of the points of the bad Muslim is that we can never fully understand other people's stories, and so when you take real people and put them into your books, uh, I feel like there's a risk that you make caricatures out of them because your understanding of them is limited, right? I mean, and so, um, but to write a fiction character that's that's three dimensional, you have to understand them completely. So I don't even authors who get inspired by people in their lives. I feel like by the time they're on the page, they're just different people. They have to be, otherwise they'd be too, they'd be flat. Um, and that would be unfair to the subject matter, so. So Sue also asked a couple of personal questions. She okay. wants to know, as an immigrant, do you feel comfortable in the United States now? Well, I, I, that's one of the things that was so um, stunning to me. Um, and I don't wanna get political, but the book is set with the backdrop of the, um, Clinton Trump uh, election. And, um, you know, some of the comments that were made at the time about Muslims, it was actually really strange because um, I'd always been comfortable in the States. Now, I'm, I have a certain privilege in the sense that, you know, I'm, uh, I don't have to wear the, the head, I don't wear the headscarf. Um, you know, when I, when I'm not, when I don't have the beard, which is often, um, <laughs> you know, there's no way really for people to know if I'm from India or from Pakistan or what, you know, so no one knows that I'm Muslim, so it doesn't matter to me unless they know my name, I guess. Um, and I've never, I've, I've, there have been instances of where I've had some issues, but for the most part, I haven't had any trouble in the States. And so that was one of the reasons that I wrote the book because when the Muslim ban was talked about and, and all this was happening, it raised the question of belonging for me. You know, what does it mean to belong to a place where you, you think you fit in until someone comes along and says, no, you're not one of us. And what happens if your family is like that, where you don't really want you because you're different from, from them? And then what happens if it's your country and what happens if it's your religion? What if you are the bad one? Um, and so uh, that's sort of one of the, the sort of the, the germs from which the, the book came. Right, and the book is written in a, with a metaphor around checkers. So Sue wants to know if you still, if you play checkers, if you still play checkers? I do play checkers. I have a seven-year-old who has not yet beaten me. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so that part, that part of the story is autobiographical. I did have a great grandmother who, um, so it wasn't my grandmother, it was my mom's grandmother. Um, and she would play checkers with me. Um, and she taught me how to play and she was ruthless. And the day that I beat her that one time, one time um, was a major <laughs> moment for me. Um, and so the, the, the checkers thing, um, you know, initially I had written the story and I didn't have it broken up with the checkers um, metaphors and breaks. Uh, and I was talking to my editor and he was like, you know, you need to find a way. He loved the Nani John character and he wanted the, the grandmother to be a presence throughout the book. And because they move and leave her behind, she sort of isn't. Mm -hmm. So how do you make her a presence in the book? And the breaking up of the book into different sections based on checker strategies and stuff, that came as a result of my editor's feedback. Great. So um, Nani John is Anvar's grandmother and um, one, of, one of my favorite characters in the book. And um, I have often quoted that little piece where Anvar says, but you never let, I never win. Yeah. 
And Nani John says, it's good for your soul. And he looks at her always up on the irony of moments and says, but what about your soul? <laughs> she says, it's not your concern. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. It's, it's so, there's so much humor in the midst of all the other things that are happening in this and happening fast in this book. And I really appreciated that about the book. And I, I just have a feeling just from the little bit of talking with you that your life is like that too. You laugh a lot. <laughs> I try to because you know yeah what's the point otherwise <laughs> so, I see why your wife thinks you're like Ambar <laughs> <laughs> oh so um would you be willing to read a little bit of your book for us sure um so I like this section of the book because it doesn't have a lot of dialogue and, or any dialogue and I don't do voices um the audiobook narrators both did a fantastic job um and I don't want to I don't want to step on their toes. Um, so I'm just gonna read um, a little bit from page five, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay, so this is right at the beginning of the book and Anwar is describing uh, Karachi and the city he's born in and um, the circumstances in which the story starts. Okay. Karachi, the city that spat me out into this world is perpetually under siege by its own climate. The Indian Ocean does not sit at the uh, does not sit placidly at the edge of the massive metropolitan port. It invades, it pours in through the air, it conspires with the dense smog of modern life and collective breadth of 15 million souls to oppress you. Under the gaze of an indifferent sun, you sweat and the world sweats with you. It's probably not as hot as hell, but it is definitely as bad as the sketchier neighborhoods of purgatory, the kinds of places you are just a little reluctant to wander after dark. When I was growing up, Karachi was a place caught between ages, grasping at modernity while still clutching at the fading relics of an inglorious past. It was a city of skyscrapers and small squat shanties. It had modern highways, but was still pockmarked with peddlers wheeling vegetables over narrow dirt lanes on carts. Imported luxury cars rumbling, shining, and glimmering in marvelous mechanical glory were not uncommon, though neither was the pitifully obnoxious braying of overladen donkeys um, hitched to rickety wagons. After a bad day at school, all I wanted was to go home. However, we were stuck in traffic and the air conditioner in our temperamental old beetle was malfunctioning. Trouble started as it often does because our mother decided to speak. When we get home, you're gonna have to take a shower. I ignored her and rolled down my window, hoping to alleviate the heat in the car a little. It was a mistake. There was no breeze and in the vain hope for one, I had let the city in. As usual, Karachi was screaming at its inhabitants and they were screaming right back. People were, le people were leaning on their ho horns, though the traffic light was red and there was nowhere to go. Hawkers carrying various goods yelled out a litany of prices in hoarse, worn voices. They sold information in newspapers and romance and strings of fresh jasmine, divine protection, that is to say cheap place pieces of plastic etched with verses of the Quran could also be purchased for a modest price. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that, that's great. I, you know, I can, I've never, I have no idea what Karachi smells like, but I have all kinds of imaginings about it now. <laughs> well, it's, it's very different now uh, from what I've heard than it was when I was growing up. I mean, that, that was a good 30, 40 years ago. So have you been back since? I have not been back since like 99. So mm -hmm. it's been a long time. Okay. All right. So you know, one of the things I noticed in the book is that, you know, the Muslim American relationships, while they were acknowledged in the book, they really took a backseat to what was happening in the Muslim immigrant communities. Was that a goal of your book or is that just, how, why, did you, how did you make a decision about that? Yeah, um, again, in some, in some ways, you know, I, I rarely, I mean, I'm not saying it never happens, but rarely do I set out to write a story with like a goal in mind, right? I'm just telling the story um, and things just happen. <laughs> but sometimes when I'm writing, I get certain goals uh, about these kind of things. You know, I want to tell a story which was from within the Muslim community. Um, and it wasn't trying to explain it necessarily or apologize for it. It was just, this is what some of the extraordinary lives are like in the community. Um, obviously not average lives because we don't write novels about average lives, not usually. <laughs> and so, you know, um, so yes, th these are people to whom extreme things happen, but um, I was really more about 
trying to talk about their humanity and how their lived experience is very much like the lived experience of most Americans. Um, and uh, as far as America as an idea is concerned, you know, one of my favorite scenes is when um, Safwa and Anwar are at, you know, they're going to the Full House buildings uh, in San Francisco um, and, or the Full House house in San Francisco. Um, and they're talking about um, Full House, the, sh the show, and they realize that, you know, even though they both come from different Muslim countries, their cultural touchstone is still the same, which is America. Um, and so I, I think that's an interesting part of America that's in the book, which is these characters are all influenced by America without even realizing it, because it, it's it's sort of, there's America the country, and then there's America the idea and the culture which we broadcast. So um, I, I think those are the two Americas that are in the book. Yeah. You, um, you had two really, well, more than two, you had several strong women characters in the book. And I'm wondering, what is it like for you to write women characters? Did you find that challenging? Did you get help from your wife or others, your mother or other people? I always get help from my from my wife. Um, well, at least I used to before she got too busy to read my stuff. Oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's not, in the, there was a time in our lives when, when I was writing this book, our kids were younger and she wasn't working because our kids were so young that I could walk up to her and say, hey, can you read this? Um, now she's, she's a teacher, so she works and it's not, she can't read it on demand anymore, which is an inconvenient for me. Um, but, um, <laughs> but anyway, yes, I got feedback from her. Um, and there are times when, you know, she says, it didn't happen with Bad Muslim so much, but with Pretty Face, um, there's a, a fight between the two characters uh, who are the love interests, and uh, she's like, you know, she, the female character really deserves a moment, a scene here to, um, to sort of express her anger and, and why this is ha happening. And so I went to my agent and I asked her, and my agent said, yeah, that's a good point. And so I, you know, uh, <laughs> I go with I go with Stephen King's uh, advice on this. He said, you know, whenever you get a note. That you're not sure whether it's correct or not, write it by somebody else. Tie goes to the author, and if if both of them vote one way, then you lose. Um, and so they both said no. She should have a beat here, and so I gave her an extra scene. So obviously, having input um, from some strong women in my own life was always helpful. Um, but yeah, the the female characters in the book, I was very apprehensive about writing um, from a female character's point of view because I didn't want to do it injustice. Um, but uh, you know, I I feel like. The, the, it worked, and the reason it worked is because of who Aza is, um, the, and her struggles are, are, are certain types of struggles. I didn't want to make it a book about the victimization of Muslim women. I wanted to have, yes, there, there is a lot of that with Safwa, but she controls her own destiny throughout the entire book. She fights for that. And then every other female character is, is, is very strong, especially the mother is a very strong character. So uh, I felt like I was able to show both sides of, of that coin. Um, and I'm a very proud of the way they came out. Uh, Nani Jan, um, you know, <laughs> Zuha, the, the, uh, the love interest for Anwar, and then um, uh, the mother who is very dominant indeed. So, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah, they were great characters. And um, one of the things that, um, I think it was Aza talked about was that um, women are supposed to be covered, and um, it's if they're not covered, you know, they're. I don't know if it's considered a sin or something, but um, but men aren't aren't um, penalized for looking at women who are not covered, right? Well, they're, they're not they're supposed, supposed to be seeing the women, but they're. Um, Right, so so Zuha talks about that actually. Um, it's when she's when she's confronting uh, uh, Safwa's father, right? Mm -hmm. um, so and and the the, the Islamic right. law is women have to be covered, but men, if you see something you're not supposed to see, you don't look back. Like you know, there's no there's no second glance, right? The idea is that modesty is in the gaze of the man and with the woman. That's the that's the the the, the theory. Um, but only one of those ever gets enforced, and that's what uh, Zuha was pointing out. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, she, you know, when a man criticizes a woman for not covering up, you, you the thing is you didn't do what you were supposed to do and look away, right? So that's what she's that's what she's pointing to. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So um, about Nani John, one one of the things I thought about her when I was reading it is she's sort of hypocritical in times. You know, like the 
you know, don't worry about my soul or don't, you know, don't listen to your mother. She doesn't know what she's talking about. And then tells Ambar to do the very same thing his mother told him to do. <laughs> so, but I also, my, my interpretation, because she was such a loving, sweet person, was that she, it, her overall message was don't take life too seriously. I don't know if that was your intention, but that was my interpretation of it. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a there's a little hint of a backstory with her that she had an unhappy marriage um, and, you know, she had discovered her freedom later in life. Um, but I think with uh, I think one of the one of the problems that Var has is that he doesn't take things that he's supposed to take seriously, seriously. Um, and I think he gets that from his <laughs> grandmother um, to, to a large extent because she sort of has that attitude don't sweat too much about life. You're not going to get out alive anyway. Um, you know, and, and he sort of takes that a, a lot further than she does. Um, and I think that's that's where that comes from. Mm. Um, and I think that's why they were so close and kindred spirits, because I think he instinctively was like that. Um, and he liked that about her. Um, you know, he, he uh, at one point says, my grandmother always took important things like games seriously, you know, um, and, and, and that's what she was like. So I think he inherited that from her. Mm -hmm. Okay. She accused him of not being very brave, right? Yes. That's and actually a, a significant theme in the book because it's his, his sort of, uh, his uh, cowardice, if you will, that she points out to him in the beginning and then it sort of haunts him throughout. And then in the end, he has this thing about, you know, America not always being brave. Um, and so he, it's, it sort of links his, his character arc um, because it's reflected in the country that he's chosen to embrace sometimes where we don't always do that either. So it's it's it's, well, it's, it's his major flaw is is his desire to sort of just go along, make jokes about everything, and not get involved if he can help it. Mm -hmm. And Hafiz, um, the uh, landlord of the apartment building that Anvar lives in, in in San Francisco, also accused him of not being brave enough, not about not chasing his passions, um, and how Hafiz was. Um, regretful that he hadn't had that kind of passion in his life. Uh, so that was interesting. Hafiz to me was a character that I, I called him the mayor of Trinity Gardens, that he, um, he basically was kind of a slumlord, right? He had really crappy apartments and made people promises and didn't keep them about fixing up things in the apartments. And yet he was, had his finger on the pulse of everything happening in the building and, um, and was a, huge part of um, of uh, people's experiences living there and also uh, of diffusing certain situations that could have been much worse for the people in the book. Um, I'm wondering what people have told you about Hafiz um, since the book was published. Yeah, generally speaking, the people always say, you know, my favorite is Nanijan or Hafiz. Those are the ones I always hear about. Hafiz mm -hmm. is my favorite as an author because he really helped, he sort of emerged. He was supposed to be there for one scene, where Anwar signs the contract and he was supposed to be gone and I had no plans of including him in anything. And then there's sometimes they're just characters that just stick with you and they keep recurring sort of on their own in your head. And you're like, oh yeah, he could be part of this scene. And so he grew into what he was. I had no plans for him when I wrote him. Um, and it's always nice when that happens like organically in a book. It's always surprising as an author, it's interesting. Um, and I really enjoyed him. He has this sort of broken English uh, syntax um, but that hides like his, his wisdom, you know, um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, I really enjoyed writing him and he was the most surprising character for me because he came out of nowhere. Like he was literally there for signing the contract to get the apartment. That was it. Um, uh -huh. but yeah, he became a major player through In fact, he's the most heroic character in the book in some ways mm -hmm. because he rescues stuff. He's the one who rescues stuff really. Yes. Yes. So, um, so the, the title of the book is tied to Hafiz and somebody's asked about where the title of the book came from. Um, my, it came from my agent. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a different title? Oh yeah, well, the, uh, Sway With Me is the only book for which I came up with the title. Everything else, um, you know, because what happens is the publisher controls the title for anyone who doesn't know. Um, and so what happened was I had, I had titled it Other People before the movie, other people came out. Um, I had written this book and I had titled it other people. And my agent was like, yeah, that's not gonna sell. Um, so <laughs> we, need to, we need to find a different title. And, um, you know, Hafiz gives discounts to what he considers good Muslims and Anwar is a bad Muslim. And, and 
he misjudges, Hafiz misjudges that and a lot of the hijinks in his building ensue as a result of that. So um, my agent came up with a, a list of titles and one of the ones she came up with was the good Muslim discount. And the other one she came up with was the bad Muslim discount. And I said, well, the bad Muslim discount sounds better and more interesting than the good Muslim discount. Um, and then about, well, once the book was announced, um, I started getting really weird looks at the mosque when people found out <laughs> what the title of the book was. And, uh, you know, I was, I called my editor and I'm like, we should change this title. <laughs> because, um, <laughs> I'm getting these looks at the mosque, like, this is not, this is not great. Um, and he's like, no, 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 we're not changing the title, we keep the title. So they went with it. Um, so that's where that came from, but it's tied to up easier, right? Well, and it's interesting because Anvar often called himself a bad Muslim, and uh, and yet he got the good Muslim discount, right? <laughs> he, he did, but you know, in in a way, Anwar's Anwar is the complex character in the sense that yeah, he's a bad Muslim in the sense you know he doesn't follow the strict rules, but as a person, he actually isn't a bad Muslim, and that's where the, one of the ironies folded yeah. into the character. He's mm -hmm. way better than he thinks he is at being Muslim, um, and and that's one of the one of the fun little jokes in the book. So. It's, it's, it's without the dogma, I think, right? Right. But, well, yeah. you don't, yeah, it, it, it's without the outward practices. Uh, inwardly, mm -hmm. he's, the, he's the better Muslim than a lot of the characters in the book, so. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, Kumar wrote in and he said, I enjoyed the book very much. It was very funny. Um, and he enjoyed the references to the famous Ghazal. He thought they were wonderful. That was wonderful. I don't remember that. Can you, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so what he's talking about is, um, uh, a ghazal by, oh my God, I can't remember. I can't believe I'm forgetting his name right now. Fez. Fez Ahmed Fez wrote, the, uh, no, actually, no, Fez didn't write this. I can't remember the name of the, of the poet who wrote this. Oh my God. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> Kamara will <laughs> probably jump on and beautiful. tell me in a moment. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a um, singer by the name of Iqbal Bano, and she's, there's a song which is playing when Anwar is late from coming back from prom that he's not supposed to go to. He comes home and there's this, beautiful poem about time and oh. uh and that's what he's referring to um and then this poem recurs later on when the father is lecturing him and torturing him with bad ice cream um you know the, the, the <laughs> that actually became was the it was one of the major inspirations for the book i mean that 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 um that poem changed my life because it really uh I, with every book i write there's usually a song associated with it um that helps either with the themes or helps with the pacing or just uh, make something click in my mind. And I will listen to that song like 40, 50, 60 times just on repeat, which drives my family crazy. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, should probably, I should probably wear headphones when I'm doing that now that I think about it. Anyway, um, but you know, so I, I listen to it over and over again um, and it just unlocks something in me. And that's, what, that, that's why the song is in the book because it really helped me write this book. Um, but yeah, it's a great question. Uh, someone else, I'm going to the chat now because people are bringing questions in, but someone said, I really enjoyed the book um, and how the book's themes were never clear cut or wrapped with a bow. Did you set out to write a book this way or did it just sort of happen? Well, you know, I think one of the great writers of our time who doesn't get any, any enough credit for doing that is Ray Romano uh, of Everybody Loves Raymond, right? Um, and one of the things I love about that show and about his work is, you know, he he was on, on a talk show once and he was talking about you know they were, they were talking about this one show where he was able to get like this really important message across I can't even remember what the message was and he said you have to earn it with the comedy you know um and, and I think that's one of the things that gradually we're losing in our culture and in our art where people just want to come out and lecture the audience and I think if you do that that it defeats purpose of art and people who want to go to lectures go to lectures, you know, <laughs> they don't watch movies or, or read books. I think it's, it's, it's good to have a theme, it's good to have messages, but the first thing to do is make it fun and entertaining. Um, so that's what I set out to do. And then to quote Stephen King, if themes come up, themes come up. Um, you know, sometimes themes come up that and connections get made by readers or your editor that you don't even see. Uh, with Pretty Face, um, my editor made a great connection about food and my main character and his relationship to food. I hadn't even caught that. So, um, you know, it, it, the themes are, are nice, but the, the work is making sure you capture the audience, att audience's attention and let, have fun with them while they're, while they're with you. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the theme of music and song 
made its way all the way through the book from Karachi, you know, all the way through punishing Anbar as an adult, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the father is a, is a fan of the music, right? And so uh -huh. um, there's, I got some cool references in um, with mm -hmm. the music, you know, I mean, and in fact, someone had me, someone suggested to me, I'm not sure if I ever did, I don't think I ever did it, but they were like, you should make a playlist of all the songs that I mentioned. And I'm like, that would be a very eclectic playlist because it goes from really high-minded stuff to not so high-minded stuff um, uh -huh. across the across the spectrum, but it's because the father uh, is really into music and it's one of his expressions um, uh, of his personality. So. Yeah, I love that scene um, with dad like shaking his hips and you know, <laughs> bobbing his eyebrows and mom trying not to smile and <laughs> it's very sweet. <laughs> so, uh, Carol's written in, she says, I hope you consider writing a sequel so we can spend more time with your characters. I, I agree oh. with her there. I think <laughs> that would be really fun. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we're, we're in the age of sequels. Well, I mean, we're in the age of movie sequels. I'm not sure we're in the book, uh, age of book sequels anymore. Someone <laughs> oh, sure me, they do. <laughs> <laughs> someone suggested to me um, writing a series of short stories um, based on uh, Trinity Gardens and having Hafiz Bhatti be a recurring character in those short stories. Um, the only problem with that is, I'm, as you can tell, I'm very verbose. And so writing anything short for me is going to be a problem. So that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea, though. Would you, um, for me, read just the dedication in your book and explain that to us? Sure. So, um, it says, for my mother, Hajar Masood, who taught me how to talk, and my father, Sayyid Manzar Masood, who asked me to speak. The first part, I think, is, is fairly evident. Um, <laughs> and so the second part, um, you know, I was, after I graduated law school, um, we, I had to go on these really long road trips. So I graduated right um, when the big financial crash had happened and nobody was hiring. Um, I wanted to be a public defender and I'd go to these interviews in all these far-flung places in California to try and get a job as a public defender, but there was a government fees on hiring. So those were really few and far between interviews. And the pool of applicants had all these experienced attorneys and I was out of law school. So I was looking for a job. I was, I, so I ended up going on these really long road trips and my dad would come with me on some of them. And we went to um, LA one time or near LA. Um, and um, on the way back, there was a news story. Um, and it was about, I can't even remember what the countries involved were, but there was something bad happening in uh, the Middle East, which, you know, is fairly common, um, unfortunately. So um, he said something like, you should do something. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm like, a, I'm like a very average attorney. <laughs> I have very little that I can do. And he's like, you just kept saying, you know, you should do something. Um, and um, when the uh, Trump Clinton election came along, you know, his, uh, his insistence that I do something um, was one of the reasons I wrote the book. It just, it, it really helped me, um, uh, push me through the, the difficult times when I was writing the book, um, because it felt like it was something that I was doing. Um, and so that's, that's what I meant by the dedication there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, there, there was a, some, a couple of different references to sacrifice in the book that I'm curious <laughs> about. Um, the one comes very early um, in the book where there's a sacrifice and um, Anbar is involved in that and his father says that wasn't the sacrifice what you're feeling now is a sacrifice which was um, a very moving moment for me um, and then there was a conversation in the United States when lots of things had been happening and Anbar was having a conversation with someone from Homeland Security who said she didn't understand how a Muslim man could kill his child, um, and how how an honor what, what, how they could commit an honor killing, right? And you had Ambar say something to the effect of, "You have to rethink that a bit. It's more of a sacrifice." Um, are those two things connected in your mind in the book and? Can you tell us a little bit more about the concept there? Sure, yeah. So um, 
this is where the Canadian in me comes out a little bit. Um, I'm going to make a reference that uh, to Margaret Lawrence, uh, who wrote a book called The Stone Angel, uh, which is a great novel. Um, I read that in college. Um, and that was one of the things, um, the, one of the major themes in that book is sacrifice. Um, because in the Jewish and the Muslim traditions, the story of Abraham is very important. Um, and the, uh, what happens for anyone who doesn't know is every year, a Muslim festival, the festival of sacrifice, um, though it's different in Arabic. Um, anyway, so uh, it translates to festival of sacrifice and um, Muslims sacrifice goats in commemoration of and in honor of Abraham's sacrifice of his uh, of his child or attempted sacrifice of his child um, in, in, in the Bible and Quran. So um, that's that's sort of a theme running into the book. Um, there's also um, you know a moment in um, in Safwa's life when the goat jumps off the roof and commits suicide. Um, you know, <laughs> and so as such, yes, yes. <laughs> kind of by accident, yes. <laughs> right. Um, and so there's, it, it's a repeated event in the book, um, and it's uh, the the concept of sacrifice of, um, uh, you know, working towards something greater, for something greater than yourself, but also uh, the parent-child relationship there is is interesting. You know, um, again, I forget who wrote this book, but someone wrote, wrote an academic piece about how um, our cultures would be very different. Uh, the Judeo-Christian Muslim cultures would be very different if uh, our founding hero was someone who had said, no, I'm not going to sacrifice my child. Like what happens to war in a situation like that? You know, what so th there's all these themes uh, within the, the goat sacrifice and the festival sacrifice that recur throughout uh, throughout the book. Uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was deliberate. Now the question becomes, and this is the question that Safwa starts to ask in, in, in Iraq, and then it becomes, and towards the end, is, you know, a sacrifice is, is based on your intent, right? The person you're sacrificing um, may not always agree with your intent, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, there is a subjectivity, and it addresses some of the um, issues of uh, the suicide bombers in Iraq that Safwa was talking about, where she's like, how can people do that? And her brother says, well, it's a sacrifice. And she's like, no, it's just, it's ridiculous because God doesn't want that. But the sacrifice isn't for the person necessarily you're giving it. There's, I don't know how to explain it. I'm doing a very good job of explaining this, but the sacrifice is in the mind of the person making the sacrifice and not necessarily in the mind of the person for whom it is made or the person who's being sacrificed. And I think that disconnect was interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One other thing you talked about was um, a moment in Pakistan where your your family, the family in the book, I, I keep thinking you're Anbar too. <laughs> well, I'm with your wife on that one. Anbar, I can assure you my family is nothing like the family in the book. <laughs> but Anbar's family um, is watching what's happening as um, Iraq is being invaded by Russia and U.S. come forces come and um, and fundamentalism um, in Islam is becoming more uh, prominent and um, someone in Anbar's family or, or maybe it was the narrator said that you know progress had just been rolled back 1400 years. It was Anbar who said that, yeah. Ambar said that. Okay. Yeah. So um, that was a really interesting uh, point to make. And I think, you know, the, it, it's something that seems um, almost inconceivable here. And yet we're dealing with fundamentalism in the U.S. too. Um, and um, I'm wondering where you think that springs from, that desire to go back to a more fundamental um, place in time. Yeah, so so uh, when Afghanistan was invaded, that's that's the reference you're making in the beginning. Um, so the thing um, is that what happened with Islam, I think what happens with us too uh, in the States is we're taught that history was glorious and things were great back in the day, right? Um, and that's part of nation building, right? I mean, that's how you build nations by convincing people we are special in some way, which has all kinds of repercussions. Um, and a lot of them aren't positive. Um, but this is what Muslims are taught, is that you know, in the Prophet's time and then subsequently for the next 
uh, 30 or 40, 50 years when the empire was expanding, um, things were great. And the natural inclination is, hey, let's go back to when things were great because things aren't great now. You know, um, and Tamim Ansari wrote a book called, um, I'll think of it, I'm sorry. Um, but there's a book talking about the, the Muslim perspective of, of history, you know, because you can tell Western history is connected to Roman history. And so it's this big arc up, right? And you can tell the story, but Muslim history was kind of like, it's kind of like a bell curve um, because things were great for a while and then they fell from power and things are not so great. And that fall from power causes a desire to go back to the state that led to the rise in power, right? Mm -hmm. And so what Muslims came to believe uh, some Muslims, I shouldn't say all Muslims, obviously, but some Muslims came to believe that, hey, if we go back to practicing the way things were done in the Prophet's time, things are going to be hunky-dory, right? The problem is that 1,400 years passed between when Anwar was telling his story and when the Prophet's time was. Um, and these great artists, these great poets came. Rumi was, was one of them. But the specific person I had in mind when I wrote that line was um, Rumi's... Um, uh, inspiration was a, a poet by the name, by the name of Atar, A-T-T-A-R. And Atar has this book, which is really cool. Um, I think I have it up here somewhere. Yep, here it is. It's right up there. Um, it's called the Conference <laughs> of It's called the Conference of Birds. Um, and some of the imagery in this book is um, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, imagery that's uh, homoerotic, let's say. And so, I as, as I was reading that book, I was thinking, man, if Atar had been writing in places today where there are these really strict regimes claiming to be Muslim, they would have executed this person, mm -hmm. right? But he became a revered poet who inspired Rumi, who is one of the best known Muslim poets in the world, right? Um, and so you're taking all that and all that tradition, and you're going to chuck that out of the window, and you're going to go back to the way things were 1400 years ago, that's not going to work out for you. Um, and so there's this idea that the, things went wrong somewhere and we have to fix it. And I think the, the states now, as the, the discontent in America grows, the question is when things go wrong and how can you go back to the past and fix the mis whatever direction we took that was wrong. And so the idea of making America great again, making Islam great again, those were parallels to me in, in that sense. Um, and uh, so that's, the, I think that's where the desire comes from. I understand the impulse. I just don't, I just think that, you know, if you were to ask people when things were good in America, different people would have very different responses. Um, and so what time were you going to go back to? Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me see. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, um, so, well, I think we're getting pretty close to wrapping up. I think um, I'm not going to, I have a couple other questions for you, but I think I'm going to leave them because they're pretty specific about the book and there's only so much we want to say. We let people read it and enjoy it. Um, someone here has asked a question. I'm not sure I follow it based on what I understand about the book. So I'm going to read it to you just to see if it makes sense to you. When Safwa was in Pakistan, um, did you imagine them in Karachi? It seems um, such a long way to travel from Basra. It, it is a long way. So um, this goes back to the Afghan war where uh, Muslims from all over the world, including Safwa's father, went to fight the war in Afghanistan, right? Um, I don't think at any point Safwa was in Karachi. I don't think that happened. She was in the Northern areas because in, ironically, given what we were just talking about, her father lived the prime of his life fighting this Afghanistan war, right? Mm -hmm. And his life falls apart and his reaction is, I should go back to when things were good. And so, so uh -huh. he, goes, he, he goes to Afghanistan where things were good in his past. So it's this repeated attempt to recapture a past that can't be recaptured because the world has changed and he has changed and circumstances are changed. But the impulse is the same impulse we we're talking about. It, and the reason she ends up going there is because her father takes her. Um, but the father's impulse is, Hey, my life was good then. It was simple. I knew who the enemy was. I could fight him. You know, I was young. Things were great. I'm gonna make my life great again. <laughs> and so that's what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. He was and, a really yeah. sad character. He was yeah, a very sad character. One of my favorite scenes is when you know uh, there's this Eid celebration and, and and he gives her the bow and he he, he doesn't realize he's out, she's outgrown it or he realizes it in some part of himself, but he's 
he's still hoping part of her is young enough. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's a touching moment. It's one of his strongest moments as a character. And then his discussion with Anwar about tea was one of my favorite scenes too. So yeah, yeah. Well, so well, um, I totally enjoyed the book, and um, I would love to know more about the ongoing lives of the characters in the book. So. If you ever think of a sequel, we at least a couple of us would well, love to read that book. I, I will say this. Well, you know, um, when I first wrote the first draft, um, the ending that Safa got wasn't there. So I hadn't written what had happened to her. I just left it, the, you know, very uncertain. She leaves and no one ever hears from her again. Um, and my agent said, wait, you're not going to end it like that, are you? I'm like, yeah. She's like, but I want to know what happens. Um, she's like, you can't just do that. I was like, well, one of the major themes in the book is, um, you know, the fact that you can't ever know the complete stories of other people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like leaving an ambiguous ending is is good. And she's like, no, <laughs> this is not good. Um, she's like, no, I want to know. Um, and so I wrote it. And I was like, yeah, okay, this works. Um, so uh, we got a more definite ending because of my agent. I think a lot of people are happy about that. So. Well, and yet we don't really know what happened. Yeah. And we, well, I think the person we know the least about is uh, Kais, you know, where do you go, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. where do you disappear to, uh, all that is, yeah. is, yeah, but I don't, I don't think anyone's clamoring for a Kais book, so. No, um. <laughs> we're not, no, but Aza, Safa, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one question I have is if you've been considered, have you been considering or is anyone talking about a movie? Um, those conversations always come and go, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, one of the ideas that I talked about where, you know, the uh, having a building where Hafiz Bhatti is in people's, um, meddling in people's lives in an apartment building, <laughs> that was from somebody who was considering making a TV thing. But, you know, you never know with these things. But right now, I, I don't know what's going on with this. So Hafiz we'll... could be a series in San Francisco along with, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, you, it, it would be, it would, it would be so different than the book, right? It would be like a It'd be like a sitcom. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it'd be great. I love sitcoms, but- well, And they um, showed up in the book pr prominently too, so. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, it, we'll see what happens, but it's a difficult book to make into a movie too, right? Because it happens in so many different places. Um, and I kind of feel like Hollywood doesn't always like that for what would have to be a pretty small budget thing. Um, they'd have to go to some pretty remote places to do it. So I'm not sure how they how they do that. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult book. Also, I kind of feel like, how do you incorporate Anwar's voice and Safa's voice into the book? Because Anwar's point, point mm -hmm. is a large part of the book. So unless you're going to do voiceovers, which never work anyway, um, how are you going to get that across? So we'll, we'll see. That is the challenge of transferring it to a different right, medium. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Well, Saeed, thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up today? No, just thank you for having me. Thank you to the friends of the Alameda County Library. Um, we talked earlier about my love for libraries and, and all that. So, um, so yeah, thank you for having me and thank you, Karen, for all your, your work and for reading and I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for attending. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. And it is uh, just one little correction. It's the Alameda City Library. So Alameda oh, is a city in Alameda County. Oh, yeah, sorry. two different libraries. See, I live in Alameda County and I never lived in Alameda City. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, so thank you, Syed, um, for your time tonight and for the wonderful book you gave us. Um, it was really a pleasure having you. Um, I would like to remind the audience um, that your book is available at Books, Inc., our local independent bookstore. And if you don't live in the area, you can go to bookweb.org to find a local independent bookstore in your area. Um, and you can always order online from Books, Inc. also. Um, we do have some upcoming programs you might be interested to know about. On March 9th, uh, we have an art docent program with showing the work of Alice Neal. I'm really excited about that one. And on March 16th, we have the author Lisa C, who will be discussing her new book, The Island of Sea Women. We hope you'll make both of those. And you can find those programs um, on our website at alamedafriends.com. And also on our website, you'll find a donation link. If you missed the one in the chat, you'll have a second chance on our website if, it, if you so choose. Um, and many thanks to my colleagues behind the scenes that make all this possible. David Beal, Karen Romer, Becky Sur, Billy Reinschmidt, and probably a few others that I'm not thinking to, remember, to thank right now. But um, thank you all. It was a pleasure having you. And we will look forward to you at our next Friends at Home event.